the second uh, session. The panel is going to focus on closing the gap between Texas schools and higher education and the workforce. The panel is moderated by Dr. Nancy Marino, another one of those great Baylor faculty who have uh, so much to offer. She's Associate Director of the School of Allied Health Sciences at Baylor College of Medicine and Senior Associate Director of the Center for Outreach. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Marino to the panel table. Well, it's wonderful to be here this morning, and I couldn't help thinking as we were listening to the first round of presentations, if we're being caught in the paradigm of almost, that seems to happen so much in our society, how many of us have made statements like, I exercise almost every day? <laughs> Which means, translated, I almost exercise on Monday, I almost exercise on Tuesday, <laughs> and we never seem to get the job done. Uh, it, it looks like we're on, a great, we're on the pathway to a great start to begin to find solutions. And the panel that follows will bridge the data that you just saw uh, and begin to examine it in the context of how to meet future workforce needs and meet the needs of our students for employment in Texas. It's a big challenge because we're preparing students for jobs that we can't even yet imagine. And even worse, it takes about 15 years to prepare students for those jobs. So we needed to have already been started. Fortunately, this panel is very qualified to address these challenges. And I think it's very significant that the panel is made up of both educators and scientists, because it seems to be in these partnership relationships where we find the real solutions. In fact, we even see it on the level of very small teacher-scientist partnerships in some of our programs at Baylor College of Medicine. We found that when we part partner a teacher and a scientist, the teacher changes. He or she usually becomes more active as a leader. Their practice changes, and their science content knowledge changes. But we also find that our scientists change. The graduate students who work with teachers have a shorter time to graduation than the other graduate students. Their science changes and they become better communicators and community advocates. So this panel represents those types of partnerships and solutions. Thomas Friedman said the fact that we've not been addressing our science education problem is a crisis. Uh, and then he quoted a friend from Stanford who said that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> so let us not waste any more time. Our first panelist is Dr. Michael Martyr, who is trained, as has been mentioned, as a physicist. But he also is Associate Dean for K-12 Education in the College of Natural Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. I think if we would ask Michael what is more challenging to explain physics concepts to undergraduates or to elementary or middle school students, I think we'd find that the answer would be the elementary students uh, because making science accurate, challenging, and inspiring students to want to know more uh, is a big mission for all of us. So please welcome Dr. Martyr. Thanks very much. I'm wondering if the, the, yes, the delightful people behind the booth have placed the presentation up. This session will be talking about the transition from K-12 school systems to college, and I will largely give you data, but since we have to get over many things, including the rivalry between a and and UT Austin, I wanted to begin by following on something that Tim Scott said. He talked about the difficulty of uh, impressing his wife, and I wanted to talk about the difficulty of impressing mine. <laughs> My wife is an archaeologist from Greece, which means that she looks back over 4,000 years of history, and uh, when she judges things, she tends to do that in that frame in which the Parthenon is a pretty good building. So. What I will try to bring to this discussion is the idea of excellence and asking not only what happens as we try to get children to pass exams, but to reach the standards of excellence without which the great institutions on which we depend have no hope of prospering. 
And so I will be focusing on that. Uh, one other thing my wife has challenged me to do is not only to present problems, but present some solutions. And that's truly scary because in some ways it goes beyond my expertise. Oh, it goes far beyond my expertise. But I will nevertheless um, venture some ideas right now at the beginning because I fear at the end I will be out of time and I will jump to a conclusion right away. And you should ask to see, if, as I go through data, whether I back it up. So what I will claim is that in the fine details of the accountability system that we have set up, we have prejudiced the schools against allowing children to reach excellence, that we have instituted enormous pressures against, particularly against administrators, to allow teachers to achieve that of which they are capable. And indeed, in many cases when teachers try to help the most excellent children reach the levels of which they are capable, they face dismissal. And so as I go through the data, one of the things I hope to accomplish is to show you how in the fine details we have reached that. And I don't know the precise policy cure for this, but I will maintain that the current situation is unacceptable and we have to gather urgently and immediately to find things without further unintended consequences that will remedy that situation or we will have no new mathematicians and scientists coming from our underrepresented populations. It will not happen. So, some definitions. I'm going to talk about college readiness, and I'm using a measure that the state provides. This measure is 11, you graduated from high school, you took the SAT or ACT, and you got 1,100 or more on the SAT or 24 or more on the ACT. That is, the, that is what is tabulated by the state, and I will later talk about whether that is a legitimate measure of college readiness as well. Uh, economic need, low income, uh, again, I use the data that are tabulated by the state, percentage of kids eligible for free and reduced lunch. All these numbers are proxies for things that are more complicated, but I think they're okay to get a big picture. And I'll also refer to top 10% students. These are students in the top 10% of their high school class who therefore become eligible for admission to Texas public institutions. And I'll talk a little bit about the consequence of the rule there. I want to present a lot of data quickly. I'm going to try to do it using pictures. Here's the, and what I'm going to add is I'm not just going to talk about passing scores, but I'll also talk about fractions of kids who got commended scores. So in order to be able to discuss that, whenever I show a school or a group of schools, I will show the fraction of kids getting commended as green. If you add the green and the yellow, those two put together will show the total fraction who pass, and then the state releases three levels of scores below passing, and I will group those as the three bars at the very bottom. So each bar will be telling you very, very quickly about five different levels of scores and not just averages or passing rates. And I really want to focus on that. I'm particularly interested in the green ones, commended. I think it's not entirely necessary that our future mathematicians and scientists will come from the green bars, but I think it's very plausible and I'll even make a case for it. So we've already discussed that the system is okay up through elementary school and then begins to run into difficulties. Let me illustrate that quickly. What I'm plotting here are results from the entire state of Texas, and I have been schools according to the percentage of kids in free and reduced lunch. So over on the left, you see in fifth grade for math, the percentage of kids who are getting various levels of uh, scores and those are kids who are very well off. Those schools have no kids on free and reduced lunch at the far left. You see that a huge fraction of them are getting commended scores. They're doing very, very well, and almost nobody is failing. Almost zero. Sliding over to the right, you see the schools where the kids have uh, high levels of economic need, and we're still not doing so badly. About a quarter are commended. Relatively small fractions are failing. Not so bad, but let's see what happens as we go up year by year. In sixth grade, slight uh, level of decline. Seventh, eighth, ninth, transition to high school. This is a, a peak in participation and population. Let me point out one feature of this. I have used a red bar, which is at 40%, which was for 2006, the fraction of students who had to pass a variety of exams to so that the school would not start to be held accountable for not passing sufficient numbers. Now, this 
particular number didn't happen to necessarily trigger the accountability system all by itself. The rules are a bit more complex than that. But the basic picture you should take from the right-hand side of the chart is that if you know the income level of kids in the school, you already begin to know that they are very likely not having enough kids pass the exams, and they are at risk under the accountability system. And just knowing the income level is enough to know that. Over on the left-hand side, the school is mainly serving the affluent. On the aggregate results show you that it's very rare for the school to be a danger of being closed. Just one of the indicators, the system's a bit complicated, but the picture I think holds true. Ninth, 10th, and Tim Scott discussed what happens at 11th grade where things are somewhat better um, for a wide variety of reasons. It's do or die time. Uh, kids are under a lot of pressure. Teachers are under a lot of pressure. There's Dropouts contribute to this as well. The scores do go up. So it's a slight recovery, but still large disparities from left to right. But notice that in addition that the percentage of green is decreasing a lot. You hear a lot about passage rates. Take a look at how the green bars diminish as you go from left to right. Thing, um, I'm going to move over into an explicit college readiness score, which I'll use the SAT for. You might wonder whether the percentage of commended kids is connected with that at all. So for every high school in Texas, I've plotted the fraction who are commended versus the fraction who are, by the state's definition, uh, with SAT scores, college ready. And the correlation is really pretty good, although there's an interesting collection of schools at the bottom in which they are, there are many commended on tax and none by the state's measure college ready. But that's small. By and large, the correlation is excellent. So college, the commended scores are not a bad proxy for college readiness. All right, let's take a look at percentage of kids in schools who are ready for college. I begin with everybody. Every high school in Texas, all the students, and I've plotted it again as a function of economic need. And what I would like to point out is that if you look at schools where more than 85% of the kids are in free and reduced lunch, I couldn't find a single school that was producing more than 10% ready for college. Now let's go on and look at this broken down by demographic groups. And I should say that one of the remarkable things that has followed from our accountability laws and No Child Left Behind is that data like this are available. It's really extraordinary to be able to stand up and state these things without much possibility of argument. Uh, Latina graduates, percentage of them ready for college as a function of economic need in the school. The general trends are even lower. African American, there are occasional bright spots. The thought way at the top at 70% is a school in Houston. So there are occasional uh, exceptions to the general rules, but I'll talk later about why there are pressures against the practices being generalized. And white. So Tim spoke about the fact that the main divide may be economic, but there are still differences for the different uh, ethnic groups as well. Strong. Now, I'd like to put this in personal terms. How many of you have put a child into schools and had to search for schools? Anybody ever had to do that? Everybody's done that. So we all know what it's like. You want to find a place where you would feel comfortable sending your kids. So let me just propose to you that one of the things you might do is say, I'd like to find a school where 30% of the kids who are, you know, sort of like my kid, 30% of them graduate ready for college. How's that seem? Criterion, would you look for that? You look for that, okay. So you are African American, and you look for a school in the state of Texas where 30% of the African American graduates are college ready by the measure I stated. How many kids, how many African, how many African-American kids are in such schools in the entire state. Data I have say 506 are 30 to 39 percent with an additional 100 in schools slightly better. So 600 out of about 30,000. If you're just running the odds, you don't have many places to send your kids that meet this criterion we've set. Hispanics, about 1,000 kids are in such schools out of... Uh, what is it, about 80,000 graduates in those schools. And for whites, you've got about 37,000 kids in such schools. So the, the odds you face are 
very daunting right now. If you're looking at uh, Latino and African American parents, and I've spoken to many, they feel a sense of despair looking at the prospects before them. They ask, what can I realistically hope for? They are willing to move, they're willing to change jobs, they're willing to go through any program you tell them, but they just don't see where they're going to go. I'm going to move on to college, talk briefly about those statistics, and uh, quickly discuss some of the implications of the top 10% rule and even using SAT scores. There's a common criticism of SAT, which is doesn't predict college readiness. It's just bad. You know, the control for income, it means nothing. Um, I want to show you the relationship between first year performance at UT Austin and SAT scores. And the correlation is really excellent. I show it over time. Um, this is first year grade point average as a function of the SAT score that you got. Very good correlation. Now, some people say, okay, that means that we should ditch the top 10% rule. It's unjust because SAT is this excellent predictor of first-year college performance. But that's not right, as I'm about to show you, either. I have broken out students here not in the top 10%, and if you plot those two together, you see that the, while for both groups, those in the top 10% and those not, SAT predicts performance in the first year. Not uh, Being in the top 10% is roughly like a 300-point boost in SAT. So it is just to give credit to students for having been in the top 10% of their high school class. Um, at the same time, SAT really does mean, it does give you some ability to look forward to students' chance of success in college. So the, I think admissions offices are actually pretty sophisticated about this and are doing fairly well. Since Richard Tapia talked about uh, faculty demographics, I won't belabor that further, but if we look out uh, to our university faculty of the top institutions, they just don't uh, look like the state of Texas right now. So is it just a matter of waiting? Is the accountability system going to fix this? That's the question with which I would like to close, and I will argue that it is not set up to do so right now. Let me try to explain why. The system rewards passing large numbers of kids and pays no attention to the numbers who are commended. So if you got 90% of the kids at a school to basically get a C-level performance on the math exams, or 95%, you are going to receive recognition and if you were to lose some of that and get more to commended, there are no bonuses in it. Now, there is state recognition for schools that have high academic achievement, but let me quickly see how many of you in the audience um, have got brand recognition associated with this. So which of the following is the acronym for the way the state recognizes schools that have got high levels of academic performance? TEA, GPA, AYP, SEM, or AEA? Hey, everyone's going to vote AEA? So no one's going to go for the uh, gold performance acknowledgement? Gold performance acknowledgement, GPA. A lot of work goes into it. Huge quantities of data are posted, and very few people know about it. Everyone seems to know about exemplary schools. But you become an exemplary school by passing huge numbers of students irrespective of the level to which they get. And that's what we're recognizing and celebrating most often. So. Um, I'm going to close by talking about, uh, very quickly, about something I've been involved with for about the past 10 years. This is somewhat anecdotal, but it illustrates the challenges. Um, we, at the University of Texas, a number of faculty tried to help low SES Hispanic students get into a magnet school that had build, been built in their own neighborhood, supposedly for the purpose of helping them get to college. They weren't going, and with relatively little intervention, uh, fair amount of effort and certain degree of love, we managed to help fairly large numbers get in. I show you here the year before they go to the magnet school in question, uh, highlighted the tax math scores of the students who are getting ready to go. You'll note that this is the highest performing sixth grade math in the Austin area, or from the two schools where the kids have been motivated to go on to this magnet school. In seventh grade, there are enormous pressures against letting them go, and the reason is very simple. Those students come from the neighborhoods that are over on the right-hand side of this chart, schools that are struggling to stay open. So if the principals let those kids go to the magnet school, they are letting some of the kids who could keep their scores, which are at the edge, go to another school where the scores don't do them, the principals, any good. One of them said, look, every morning a bus pulls up in front of my school and 70, 17 students who ought to be helping me get above this line head off somewhere else. How can you do this to me? And I have no answer for him. 
Therefore, while with the 10 year effort we managed to get um, students into what I think is the highest achieving and most challenging curriculum in the Austin area, and the numbers got up to nearly 200 or about a third of the school, pressures to the pressures working against that have forced things back, and the numbers have dropped down to the levels that they were at when the program just began. I submit that although we wish that every school offered equal education, right now that is not the case, and that the administrators are in fact are motivated to put students in the schools where the scores are the lowest rather than the ones that would best prepare them to uh, rise to the level of their abilities. So I conclude. Uh, race and class still predict performance, and this is particularly pronounced when one looks at college readiness. The accountability system is focusing on percentages of students who pass and paying in the public's mind and in the uh, accountability dictates relatively little attention to achieving excellence. Uh, Hispanic and African American families face daunting challenges in finding any place to place their children right now. The pent up demand for this, I believe, is absolutely enormous. And the administrators and the parents have, in fact, conflicting interests right now. We talk about all stakeholders, but what if stakeholders pull in different directions? I believe they are. And if we want to address the demands of the Gathering Storm Report and meet the goals of this meeting, these problems have got to be addressed now. Certainly thought-provoking statistics. Our next panelist is Brenda Wanowski, who is Program Officer of the T-STEM Initiative of the Texas High School Project. Uh, she has broad experience both as a classroom teacher, as a curriculum designer, and now at the level of designing innovative approaches to solve our challenges in science education. Um, it, this is her first experience in Texas, so um, I'm sure you will all give her a, a Texas-style welcome. Brenda? Like Lori said, I've been here with you for seven months. I, I came from Ohio, and previous to that, I was with the University of North Carolina system. So I, I got a lot of background there, and I'm gathering my background here around your Texas system. So what I'm interested here in is this redesigning of the Texas high schools under the Texas High School Project. Uh, what we're going to show you is some relatively simple slides around what you've seen to be some very, very complex issues. So in the, for the sake of clarity, I've tried to make these just as easy to see as I possibly can. When we start looking at why we need a Texas high school project, one of the things that's important to us, of course, is the graduation rate. What is important to us also is the graduation rate across ethnic groups. And here you see quite clearly a disparity, although I will tell you this is ninth grade entry, 12th grade exit after four years. Okay. Also, when we start looking at the exit level passing rates, these are the preliminary scores for spring of 2007. Again, you've heard some of the complexities around these numbers, but this gives you a clear pattern, again, around ethnic groups and the economically disadvantaged. One of my fellow panelists is going to talk to you a bit about the complexities behind this slide and this particular standard. But here you see English, language, arts, and math according to the higher education readiness standards. Again, look carefully across the numbers. All students, African Americans, Hispanics, and whites. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, based on these numbers, the Texas High School Project is on a mission. Uh, our mission is to help all of the Texas high school students achieve at their highest educational potential. We want to promote state competitiveness in the 21st century. More often, you hear our vision. Our vision is that all Texas students will graduate high school ready for college and career success and be prepared to be contributing members of the community. Based on the materials that you've heard before, the data you've heard before, based on the reasons behind the Texas High School Project, we concentrate on urban areas and the Texas-Mexico border. We concentrate on first-generation college students and we concentrate on the economically disadvantaged students. Our programs uh, cross many areas, early college high schools, new schools and charter schools, redesigned high schools. We also work with district engagement with central offices education leadership, both with principals and teachers, and my particular area, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics initiative. But you see what we're looking at here are new school options across Texas. Again, I'd like for you to see where we're concentrating the types of projects that we have out now, how they're distributed geographically, our projections for students directly impacted by the students in this particular time period, 07, 08. Now, this for me is a very important slide because you can see that we are, in fact, meeting our objective of serving particular groups within the ethnic areas of need in Texas. We concentrate very heavily in Hispanic populations and African American populations, making up about 90% of our service. Also, it's important to look at socioeconomic. We concentrate, as we said, on the economically disadvantaged, and here we're serving about 70% of our population within the economically disadvantaged sector. Uh, this is based on free and reduced lunch. As you know, there are many, many other factors that could be used, including all of the Title I-B areas, but this is free and reduced lunch. Now, as an example of what we do, I'd like to look at STEM education. And what we're concentrating here is developing our teaching and learning strategies around innovation and invention. Uh, this is important to me because I came here from the National Inventors Hall of Fame. So <laughs> I, I really want us to work in terms of invention and innovation. And also, it's very important to me that we do an integration across these areas. Our goals within STEM, remember this is just one of our many areas, and we have a very limited time, so we're just looking at one. Our goal is to create 35 STEM academies, serving approximately 20,000 students. Uh, right now, we are at 30, so we're doing well at that. Uh, establish five to six T-STEM centers, geographically dispersed across Texas. We're at seven, so we're doing well at that. Uh, the statewide best practices STEM network, uh, TEA has been very kind to help us in this in uh, putting out RFAs that allow us to have a number of schools that are within our network and are able to showcase their best practices. 
and to increase the pool of highly qualified STEM teachers and leaders. This is where I talked about our leadership areas. Looking at our STEM academies, here you see we're just beginning, people. Uh, we have academies that opened in 2006. So we've got one year there. We have academies that opened in 2007. So they've been open, what, like a month? And then we've got the academies that are to open in 2008. Those academies are in their planning year. And these make up our 30. These are a mixture of schools. Some are public charters. Some are uh, pub traditional public. Some are standalone. Some are small learning communities. All have autonomy. The small schools have approximately 100 students per grade. They are secondary schools. Uh, some will include the feeders starting with sixth grade. Some will only be nine through 12. They all serve a population with a majority representation of high need students. And there's no creaming. They all have to be open enrollment. They all have to take their applications. And admission has to be by lottery. So it's across the board. We don't just put them out there and let them go. Uh, we do have significant service that we provide to these academies in terms of a blueprint uh, based on research into effective practices for building schools and in terms of coaches that go in and work with the schools. We also, whoops, have centers across Texas that work to serve these academies. It's important to note that these centers also serve other schools. They provide professional development to other schools across Texas, not just the academies. They have an area of expertise that translates across the whole of the state, for example, in engineering or rural education. And these academies, the academies are served by centers the centers also have support from the Dana Center. So we are trying to put together a whole series of support mechanisms. I do want to say that the Texas High School Project is very pleased with our working relationship with TEA in that they provide significant support for us. Uh, we have support from the governor's office, uh, from the state legislature, and you will hear later today from your state representative and your state senator, uh, Florence Shapiro and Rob Eisler, who are very, very critical to STEM education. Uh, we have a great deal of private support from the Gates Foundation, the Dell Foundation, the Wallace Foundation, and the Greater Texas Foundation, who is also a supporter of your work here today. We do have business area support from National Instruments, so we are not without resources, and we won't pretend that we're working without resources. So please feel free to contact us. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be with you in Texas, and I look forward to future work. Thank you. Certainly, again, as we look at this type of innovative project, partnerships seem to play such a key role in finding innovative solutions to our challenges. Uh, our next panelist is going to address increasing the number of graduates in critical fields for Texas by the year 2015. Uh, Lori Bricker probably has the broadest range of expertise of anyone on our panel and has served in leadership roles uh, in parent organizations. She's led the, H the Houston Independent School District Board of Education uh, twice as president and now represents Houston on the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And she's also associate director of DEPFA First Albany Securities. So, Lori. You know what they say about a little, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. 
Um, I have to be very careful in, in being very precise today because I have at least three superintendents in the audience, three former superintendents, two of which were mine and one of which I think signed my diploma. <laughs> Just kidding, Dr. Reagan. Um, I think the biggest aha moment came for me um, in 1996. I'd been on the Houston School Board for just a few months, and we were at a conference in Austin, and there, was a, um, there were two panelists. One was the uh, vice president of the University of Texas, and the other was an associate chancellor at the uh, Texas A&M system. And they both made comments about closing the gaps and about the continuum. And I think that was the first aha moment that about 35 urban districts in the state of Texas all at the same time thought to themselves, I guess our responsibility is more than just getting these students to graduate from high school. And it wasn't just me, I think it was everyone that had that aha moment. And that was my first um, probably experience of, of understanding what closing the gaps means. And from my background and my experience, closing the gaps is not just about the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board's um, overarching concept of closing the gaps between students graduating from high school and going on to college and being successful, by the way, in college, but closing the gaps is really all of the gaps, the gaps between children that have absolutely no early childhood experience and those that do, and then they all end up in kindergarten, and our children have very, very different experiences from those that have had absolutely no preschool experience, those that go K through five and then enter middle school, and they've come into this country, they've come into the state, they've come into the city with various levels of expertise, with various levels of experience, and with parents sometimes who are first generation and don't speak our language. So there's yet another gap. The next gap, and this is the gap that I found as a school board member, was probably one of the most critical, is what we called the ninth grade spike. Those that were entering high school with not quite enough credits and never did get quite enough credits and uh, tended to just get stuck in that area and then drop out. And then, of course, the one where the Higher Education Coordinating Board has focused, and that's in closing the gaps, which means those that are graduating from high school and going on to college. Um, another part of my... Um, different experiences that I was lucky enough when I first got on the Houston School Board that the state of Texas already had an accountability system in place. This is very, very, very unique. Those of you from Texas, like, like me, we probably think that everybody had an accountability system in place. That was not the case. It wasn't until No Child Left Behind that every state finally had an accountability system in place and we were able to actually measure progress of our students. That was very critical and I think probably most of us took that for granted that everyone had that. The other um, um, part that I inherited was when I got on the coordinating board and closing the gaps was already a concept and an overarching goal of the coordinating board that was already in place. And so. Basically, there are four components of closing the gaps, which is the overarching goal of, of the coordinating board for the state of Texas. Um, the three areas in the state of Texas where the most students um, in this participation of adding 630,000 more students, and this is to get us to 1.6 million students participating in college. And the three areas um, of the state that are most critical to that are the Metroplex, South Texas, and the Gulf Coast area. And that's why we're focusing so much on those three areas. That's not to say that we're not focusing on all of the state, but that's where the majority of students to participate in college, and this will just get us at 5.7% of the total projected growth in Texas. So this isn't putting us like on the map as the number one state in the country of having the most students in Texas. This puts us probably maybe at the middle. Next is closing the gaps in success. Um, one of the things that I found as, as a coordinating board member is that participation is probably not as big a challenge as success. Um, you know, in, in the K-12 sector, we call it a dropout rate. In higher ed, we call it a persistence rate. This means students that are actually getting into college and staying there. You remember the old, the old saying, look to your left, look to your right. You know, two of you won't be here in another few years. You know, that's the exact opposite of the philosophy that ne we need to produce throughout the state of Texas in order to make sure that these students are successful. Already we know that between 40 and 60 percent of students that are graduating from high school need developmental education. That means remedial education. That means not getting credit toward a degree. That means pushing them further and further away from their goals of actually being successful. 
Uh, we also know that in order to participate, that 80 percent of the projected enrollment of 630,000 more students, 80 percent of those are going to have to go to community colleges. Well, look around the state, and you know that many, 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 especially in Houston, community colleges are either at capacity or many of the community colleges have to have, to have annexation um, elections, have to have tax rate um, increases, and have to have bond elections just in order to get more students into college and have facilities for them. So, you know, if you look around, you're not going to see Rice University or Texas Southern or U of H or UT or A&M taking another 50 or 60,000 students. They're going to have to come from community colleges. And making sure that these students are college ready, the opportunity is with community colleges and the partnerships that we already have and need to cultivate with our high schools. The next, and this is something that you all are probably focusing on more than anything, and that is, is that we must substantially increase the number of nationally recognized programs or services at colleges and universities. This means that by implementing an accountability system that we already have in place with like universities, that we need to implement this with um, some sort of rewards and consequences so that we know that colleges and universities are actually getting better. And I don't just mean by uh, U.S. News and World Report. I mean that by looking at colleges and universities across the state, they need to be competing with colleges and universities across the nation. And finally, the fourth goal um, of closing the gaps is in research. And that means in federal science and engineering research, funding to Texas institutions. We all know that in order to become a top-tier university, that that is one of the criteria. This slide uh, shows uh, the high school uh, grads that are entering four-year um, institutions with the recommended curriculum or above. And that's really, really important. If you look at the year 2000, where 67 percent of our college um, entering freshmen had the recommended curriculum, and now at 97 percent, less, actually less than 3 percent of the entering freshmen um, do not have the uh, recommended curriculum. What's really key there is that there's a new law from this last session, legislative session, Session, that in order to get into a four-year university in the state of Texas, a public university, you must have the recommended curriculum. And this is, of course, what it looks like. And in particular, make note of math uh, with the 2004-2005 entering class, math and science with three credits, and now the recommended four. And so the, the real challenge is how can we increase graduates in critical fields? If you look at the uh, STEM, STEM side of it, we need to almost double the number of, of uh, graduates in critical fields in order to reach our target goals of 2010. Nursing and allied health were probably a little bit more on target. Look at our teachers. If it weren't for alternative certification programs, we wouldn't even be close to this number. But we need another 7,348 teachers just to meet our goals of 2010 and closing the gaps. And in math science teachers, it's even more critical. I mean, you can see where we are there. Fortunately, the graduation rates at public universities are improving. You're looking at four-year, five-year, and six-year graduation rates. And at six-year, by 2005, we're actually at 60 percent by six years. But that's not good enough. We have to look at four-year and five-year graduation rates, if nothing else, just to make more space in our universities for these students. The good news is that there is a, a, a real focus on alignment issues, on closing the gaps from early childhood all the way through college and beyond. The recommended high school program that I, that I uh, mentioned is already a law, uh, so that by 2011, all of that entering class must have the recommended high school curriculum. Um, developmental, uh, development of college readiness standards, we're actually going to vote on those standards. We're working very closely with TEA and with a uh, vertical team uh, from early childhood all the way through 16 that is helping us align college standards. And no more are we going to look at silos of education where, well, early childhood's doing okay, well, K-12 might be doing okay, well, college is doing okay, and then we turn around and blame everyone for not having students college ready. Um, the establishment of math, science, and technology teacher preparation academies. All of the amazing partnerships that we have with NSF, with, with Hulink, with all of the different organizations, including the Texas High School Project, um, all, of the, all of the programs and projects and collaborations that we already have. Also, the engineering and technical 
technical consortium. We have funding grants throughout the state. We have student mentoring, work study opportunities. All of the support systems are in place to make sure that we are moving in the right direction so that we can have the kinds of college graduates, the kinds of teachers in the critical fields that we absolutely need, not just for the state of Texas, not just as Dr. Murdoch talks about all the time, about the, the, uh, the um, tie between the, the success of, of the economic impact of our country and the academics and the numbers of students who are graduating, but for the state of Texas to compete with the rest of the nation. Um, this is just some contact information, and, and uh, I'll look forward to questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our final panelist in this session is Jeannie Becker, who is Associate Director of the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, known as NSBRI. She's also Chief Scientist of that group. And at the same time, I have no idea how she manages to do all of this, is an advocate on a national level for the involvement of women in science, a topic that has not yet been touched upon uh, in this meeting. Um, I think it's also important to point out that this is a female majority panel. So on that note, I will introduce Dr. Becker. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Jeannie Becker, and I'm a scientist. And I feel so much better for saying that now. Uh, in, in a room full of uh, educators, this is, uh, this is very sobering for me. I'm also an administrator, and through my good friends and colleagues at Baylor, I am learning to be an educator. Um, I want to first give you an overview of um, the education program at National Space Biomedical Research Institute, NSBRI, and then talk a bit about how we developed the program in support of our partner, NASA, um, and in alignment with national initiatives for excellence in science and technology, engineering, and math. Uh, and I want to give you a little bit of background on what NSBRI is so you'll have a frame of reference. We are a not-for-profit academic research consortium um, we operate under a cooperative agreement with NASA, and we represent the um, major extramural scientific community that helps NASA achieve its goals. Um, we fund research in an interesting manner. It's a collaborative approach and a team approach, so that we have 10 research teams um, that's divvied up according to uh, basic uh, physio physiological disciplines. So we have the bone loss team, the muscle team, the nutrition team, et cetera. And, um, Work occurs within teams as well as between teams. So it's, it's extremely collaborative uh, interaction based on partnerships. Um, across the portfolio, we fund about 60 to 70 research uh, and technology projects at one time. This is a national program. And uh, as you can see summarized on this slide, we also have a very robust um, education and outreach program. And although I'm Representing on this slide um, education separately, it really is an integral part of our science and technology program in that for every research project that we fund, there's an average of three trainees mentored annually, and that goes from undergraduate through postdoctoral fellow level. Uh, we also have educational expertise on our board of scientific counselors that acts as our peer review body to make sure that, that we're going along in, a, in an appropriate fashion um, guided by peers in the field, and we also have educational expertise on our board of, or on our um, external advisory council that helps us with overall portfolio uh, balance and, and program management. Um, because our organization focuses on space, we, we actually are quite aware of the points where young people fall off the path in pursuing STEM-related disciplines. Um, our initial uh, program in education focused on K through 12 efforts to expose um, young folks to science, engineering, and technology opportunities relevant to space. Um, this really is especially critical for little girls who will lose interest in STEM-related disciplines if those interests are not nurtured um, in elementary school. And this then results in fewer women entering into the workforce in science, technology, and engineering. Um, since the, the early portion of the Institute, we're now 10 years old, uh, and we have another 10 years to go under a cooperative agreement with NASA, uh, we've started filling gaps in undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral level training. Uh, we also uh, have a summer intern program that provides 10 to 12 week internships for undergraduates to spend time directly in laboratories with scientists at Johnson Space Center. And this uh, has become a national program now. Last year, we received uh, over 88 applications 
from interested uh, undergrads across the country. We place about 15 to 20 interns per summer. In graduate and postdoctoral level training, uh, we have instituted two new programs. One is a graduate program leading to the PhD in space life sciences. This is, um, this is a brand new program. It's only in its second year of operation. Uh, it's being developed jointly between uh, Texas A&M and MIT with program oversight, um, integration, um, and coordination occurring through um, Dr. Bill Thompson um, here at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, he also serves as our education program overall leader. Uh, we have a postdoctoral fellowship that's now just beginning its fourth year of operation. And the next challenge, and Bill doesn't know about this one yet, um, is that we're going to be addressing issues related to early career development, that is, uh, nurturing young investigators who are just starting as instructors and um, assistant professors, uh, realizing that the average uh, NIH funding now, first-time funding, occurs at an age of 42. Uh, relative to age 37 in 1990, and that, to me, as a scientist, is, is astounding. Um, we have very active programs in teacher professional development and curriculum development. These both use an extensive array of web-based resources. Again, this was um, relying heavily and leveraging our partners through um, Baylor Education and Outreach Center. And we support continuing medical education for NASA flight surgeons and trainees at uh, University of Texas Medical Branch residency program, again, um, managed by the um, BCM Education and Outreach. Uh, we have new partnerships uh, developing with the Irish Fast Governmental Organization that provides six-month training opportunities for top graduates from Irish universities in NSVRI-funded laboratories. That's going on in Houston and in, in Boston now. And we're in the planning stages of developing a program that spans high school through postdoc with our Russian colleagues at the Institute for Biomedical Problems. Interestingly enough, in, in talking with, um, with our colleagues in, in Russia, uh, they are, too, experiencing um, a, a bleeding of young folks going into STEM-related disciplines in favor of going into uh, business and finance-type careers. Um, ultimately, the end goal for us is a trained professional, and we're keeping tabs on how our educational program uh, impacts career choices and career development paths for the, the young people that are participating in the various aspects of the program. Um, this, in particular for NASA, is, is a very crucial issue. NASA is experiencing an aging workforce, and they are truly in danger of losing their expertise to support the national vision for space exploration. Keeping young people interested in pursuing uh, STEM-related careers is vital to assure a healthy space program and overall to assure um, uh, healthiness as a nation as a whole. This schematic uh, illustrates the academic partnerships that the NSBR education program encompasses and at what educational level. Uh, I, I mentioned already our strong relationship with Baylor um, and with additional partners across Texas, Rice University, which is one of um, our consortium members, University of Texas Medical Branch, Texas A&M, uh, and uh, as well as abroad with uh, the Colorado Consortium for Space Science um, and uh, the uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Uh, the summer internship program is, uh, is facilitated through uh, our headquarters through Kathy Major. Uh, again, this doesn't include the, the many universities across the country are, that are supporting over 200 trainees annually through grant-funded research activities. So to summarize overall, we have, a, we have a portfolio of approaches leading to tangible products with measurable outcomes. So, uh, so what are some of those measurable outcomes? In the area of curriculum development, um, uh, we have a series now of seven instructional guides for teachers. Um, these contain um, inquiry lessons aligned with NSF standards. Six more guides are also in development. In the last five-year period, these, these uh, guides have been used by 32,000 teachers are impacting over a million students. In this same period of time, uh, instructional and in-room laboratory experiences uh, have been conducted impacting over 15,000 teachers. And um, for web-based approaches, uh, the BioEd online site, which is housing a lot of our material for our graduate education program, um, has experienced over 1.2 million unique visitors last year. And I am no techie. In fact, I'm rather IT challenged. But even I know that is really, really broad-reaching impact. Um, for career development, uh, undergraduate through postdoc in the last five years, 75 interns have been placed at Johnson Space Center, and we supported 10 labs involved in training um, 
Irish interns. As I mentioned, the graduate program is really new. We have four students going through the program at the present time. This, this is really um, a very unique program in that it is utilizing um, existing expertise at accredited institutions across the country uh, to develop modules of course content that then um, support the PhD in space life sciences. And it's very exciting development uh, last week, Texas A&M uh, just approved a certificate, so on, on the degree it will state that the, uh, that the degree uh, has been granted to someone with specialization in space life sciences under a parent discipline such as bioengineering. I'm, see, I'm getting a, a minute uh, warning here, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, move along, but um, we, we really do feel like these programs are inspiring young people to go into space-based research by stimulating excellence in science, math, and engineering and creating new types of models for uh, graduate and postdoctoral training. Um, now let's factor in a, a little bit about uh, workforce considerations. Um, we all know that competitiveness is a global challenge and that to keep up the U.S. must support an educated workforce and in fact that certainly is a driver behind rising above the gathering storm. Nationally, advancements and innovations in science and technology must be encouraged in order to keep up with international efforts, certainly, and to um, support continued economic growth and development in this country. This has to be accomplished all the while absolute numbers of people um, entering the workforce in STEM areas is certainly declining. This makes it critical to target and draw upon the full spectrum um, of our human capital. Uh, so really diversity, in fact, is the key to uh, adding strength and power to the workforce, just as we've heard from the speakers before me. Um, I touched on this briefly regarding the recruitment of women into the workforce, and there was a report issued um, last year called Beyond Bias and Barriers from the National Academy of Sciences. And it, it looked at the last 30-year time frame of women and minority group members um, in, the, in the workforce and entering the workforce not in just this country, but, but globally. It showed that, in fact, larger numbers of women and minority group members are entering the workforce, um, yet we have fewer women that are at the upper level of ranks and, and as well as their minority member um, counterparts. Um, it was noted in the report that highly uh, focused institutions that grant up to 50% of their degrees in science or engineering um, exist across this country, yet fewer than 30 percent of the faculty above the level of assistant professor um, are women. One premise of the report was maybe the female are not as, as uh, productive as their male counterparts, but in fact they found that they, they were equally productive. Um, and what they found in, the, long, in the, the end point of the report was that declining representation of women in advancing ranks in science and engineering, um, as well as in some organizational leadership positions that were evaluated, um, it was found to be associated with organized um, organizational structures that actually underutilize women in these career settings. And the report discussed some of these barriers, which were compensation and equities, which is a subject known to all in the room, um, access to relevant mentoring and cross-cultural misinterpretations. So the take-home message really from the study is that changing these um, biases at an organizational level begins with encouraging excellence in science and engineering at all stages of the educational experience so that graduates in these fields are sure fulfilling and productive careers. Do I have one last slide? Or? Okay, I actually have a summary slide. Um, so just from our experiences at NSBRI, um, some strategies that, that we've thought about you know, going forward. One way to enhance the educational pipeline is certainly through partnerships, and we've done this very successfully. Um, this is, allows us and, and potentially others to um, have very good leveraging of the hard-fought resources that, that we were able to um, have, and we're very appreciative of that, but certainly it's not enough to get the job done, and we also all know that. Um, the end result is programs that facilitate recruitment and retention of educators and ultimately an educated workforce. Secondly, um, it's, it's critical, and we heard this from Senator Hutchinson, to maintain support for research, research and development efforts to expand knowledge, create new resources, and facilitate new innovations. And finally, to, to leverage the strengths of existing educational programs like we're doing with our PhD program in space life sciences um, that will give new approaches to uh, both teaching and learning. And I would use adding the power of uh, internet-based approaches to broaden the reach. Thank you.
been told that we're allowed to have two questions. <laughs> and I have a stack, so if we don't pick your particular question, I please encourage you to, to speak with our panelists. It also was asked, this, this uh, panel is addressing issues all the way up through the workforce and who is addressing the workforce in that sense. And that is Dr. Becker on this panel who is preparing to meet uh, space life sciences and NASA workforce needs. You'll also find that throughout the conference we'll begin again to move it forward into those issues. Um, the first question that we received, um, I'm going to ask first uh, Lori Bricker to respond and then perhaps everyone could just say a word or two about how the uh, gathering storm addresses the need for both university and technical college graduates. But what is the need uh, for certified teachers in these fields and what are we doing to fill the need? Okay. Um, the uh, Commissioner of Higher Education, Raymond Paredes, um, has established a subcommittee of the state P-16 council that is focusing just on that issue. And that is more and more um, encouragement of teachers going into the fields, in particular STEM fields. Um, it's pretty obvious to all of us that if you look at the any given urban city and you look at all of the universities in that city and how many educators they're producing, that right now um, the alternative certification programs throughout, this, throughout the state are producing as many as three to four times as, uh, as many teachers. So we're looking at not only teacher um, numbers of teachers, teachers going into education, actually staying in education, which also turns into another whole field of how to pay for them, incentive pay that was mentioned earlier, in particular performance pay, um, but also looking at teachers throughout the state that are going into the science and critical fields. And that's going to that's gonna require an entire statewide effort to encourage these teachers, not just from the universities, but from the, um, the cities themselves that are, that are looking at school districts that are opening up, with, with, uh, opening up school with teachers that are not in their own critical fields, that don't have that expertise, and that are teaching out of subject area. I would like to add briefly that I think the shortage was referred to by Tim Scott who cited a number of approximately 8,000 science and math teachers who are under-certified. That's the order of magnitude we have to cure and I believe we have at least one promising pathway for that which you may hear more about later. The uh, You Teach program at UT Austin and a uh, similar program, Mass, at uh, Texas A&M are very promising models that are in the course of being replicated across the state. I think if uh, many institutions adopt these models, it may be possible to make substantial progress on the shortage of science and math teachers. I want to look at this more at the national level, and I think one way to improve the number of teachers in the STEM fields is to uh, improve the um, I don't know what word I want to use, but improve the importance in the public view of teachers at in the STEM fields. I have a great friend, Joanne Vasquez, who is the first uh, K-12 teacher to serve on the National Science Board and actually served in the production of The Gathering Storm. I think that by having a teacher on the National Science Board, we are in fact improving the status of teachers and showing that teachers are quite important to the production of reports such as this. I think that's a way to bring more teachers in. I would just add, on. Just add, um, one thing is to make teaching fun, to make the educational material interesting, to make them excited and want to deliver that material to get kids excited. And, and, and one way to do that, and I'm biased of course, is, is space as the hook. And actually a lot of, of kids get interested in science and in math and certainly in engineering because of what needs to be done in order to think about space, to do things in space, to support, to support growth um, of, of us exploring. And I think there's no kid or adult that can't relate to that. And I think that when you give new material and make it fun and interesting, that you can incorporate principles that are fundamentals of, of science, engineering, and math into those course lessons. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do one more question. 
Uh, and this is uh, addressing a, a different issue that's also very important to student success in the workforce. Um, and I'm going to, again, ask each of the panelists, we'll actually start, start with Dr. Martyr, to just comment briefly on this. Um, many students could be better served and graduate if they were given the opportunity to learn skills and be gainfully employed, employed and handle life skills, like balancing a check, checking account, uh, much less calculating uh, 10, per, 10 percent mentally. Um, why is, how, how are, are these issues, even the more basic science and math literacy skills that students need to just cope with everyday life, how are these being addressed and what are strategies that we can use to improve these? I think when science and mathematics education are effective, they relate the topics in the classroom to things that people care about in their lives. And so many of the efforts at reform of the subjects want them to go beyond uh, temporary rote learning into learning that does make that sort of impact. But, but I'll say more, which is that another thing I've heard often from teachers is that they feel every school ought to provide a wealth of opportunities for students to take part in education that's rel uh, relevant for their lives. So a greater focus on vocational education, a greater focus on education that leads to college, a greater focus on education in general that clearly leads somewhere so that every student as they make their choices sees what they are going to do with their life with what they are learning every day. And so I would put the list of items mentioned there in a longer list that I would say should be apparent to students every day. I, I want to echo that I think that relevance is quite important uh, to addressing the issue. But um, I want to look also at the idea of rigor and that I believe that a rigorous curriculum actually encourages students to uh, be more productive in the basic areas that we're talking about. I think when we set this rigorous high expectation of all students that we tell students, yes, you can do this. We believe you can do this. And when we say that to students, I've always found that, in fact, they do. I think probably the greatest challenge is to move from pockets of excellence across the state into an across the state excellence of all programs. Um, you teach was, was mentioned earlier. That is probably one of the most successful programs encouraging uh, math and science teachers. Um, and, and I know that the University of Houston is looking at that program. Uh, Rice University has had a program with, with the Houston School District training science teachers for at least 10 years. Um, but we're looking at, again, pockets of excellence, um, areas of expertise where uh, we have incredible collaborations that are just in one or two areas. I think looking at replicating those areas and supporting those areas so that more and more um, areas across our state will have that opportunity. I want to speak to one of the words that was brought up just a minute ago, relevance, and, and, and come at this from the, the student's perspective. Kids are getting information in an entirely different way these days than when most of us were, were taught. In a classroom, taught out of a book, you do a lesson. Kids are hooked up to their cell phones and their iPods and they're listening to different things in both ears and they're used to getting multiple types of information in multiple ways. And I think that one way of making uh, material subject matter relevant to them is, is maybe presented in a way that they understand in a, in a um, a forum that they can get it. And, and maybe that's going to mean some, some creative uh, reorganization of how lesson plans are delivered. And it's certainly going to be an onus on the part of the, the educator, because it's not the way any of us or most of us know how to educate. But maybe some of us need to be educated in that. Thank you all. I know there are many more questions, but we'll save that for the next break. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we come to uh, session three, the last session before lunch. And to quote the famous Texas philosopher, Willie Nelson, mamas don't let, mama don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys, could have been mamas don't let your babies grow up to be scientists and engineers. We have a culture problem in, in, the, in, in the population. It was one of the first issues that the education committee brought up, how do we deal with this? And so we're very, very fortunate to have this topic with uh, 
Professor Yuri Treisman going to be the moderator. He's the professor of mathematics and public affairs at the University of Texas and founder of the an executive director, as you all know, of the Ch Charles Daner Center. Dr. Treisman. Uh, culture change. Hmm. The only group of human beings that likes to be changed are infants. Hmm. If we're thinking about changing the culture in ways that help us meet our national needs, uh -huh. we need to have a balanced message between urgency and hope. Uh -huh. The framing we heard of the problem at the beginning, what we're doing wrong and how we can fix it, how can we fix it, is not going to be sufficient for driving the public to continually raise math and science standards and encourage people to pursue math and science. I started my career as a landscape designer and architect before I shifted into mathematics. The two lessons one learns in landscape architecture, day one, Garrett Ekbo's course, you do not build a garden before you watch where people walk. You do not build structures on weak foundations. We have to balance our message between the challenges that are objectively before us, which are many, and the strengths that we can actually build on. Let's just take a second. So first, the exigencies and vicissitudes of everyday life in the education fast lane has sidelined two of our four, two of our four panelists, uh, Megan Groom, senior policy analyst at NGA, and Rebecca Lucor, the executive director of the Bear Foundation, uh, both uh, experiencing early flu season. So it's Alan Friedman, my colleague, and me here. <laughs> and maybe we'll get to lunch on time. So um, uh, I know you're anesthetized by data, but I want to show you some more and a slightly different slant on the material that Darv Winnick uh, presented. So is it? No, I, I'd love to impersonate Michael, but here we go. So, OK, just a word about where we've come from. Is everyone's thinking of Sputnik this week. 50 years ago, 25% of high school graduates took Algebra I. A dozen years ago, 50% roughly of high school graduates took ninth grade algebra, or maybe took it in the eighth grade, but algebra one. Today, 14 states are requiring four years of math and science. 33 states are requiring algebra two. 16 states, or 14 announced, but shortly 16 states are using a common Algebra II end of course exam. Massachusetts and Arkansas are going to be using the same instrument to measure Algebra II performance. This is a profound transformation. Right? When you're in meetings with governors, recently at the NGA, this summer with the chief state school officers, the doors close and they all say the same thing. We are so far ahead of our public on this, uh -huh. We cannot continue to push without massive support from our public. Politicians can only be a little bit ahead of their publics. Now they're way out in front. So what are the messages of hope that we have to put in? Um, Darb showed, talked about eighth grade data. I just want to show where Texas is compared to California Right, the other state that looks like Texas demographically. So what are we looking at here? A map, by the way, Darv Winnick has gone from being the designated irritant to the hero <laughs> of people working on school reform because he provides real data. What do we see here? On the bottom, uh, so now this is eighth grade NAEP scores. What do these scores mean? You see Texas 300, Massachusetts, the top performing state, 305. Very roughly 10 points is one year of learning. 
If we look at our white kids, Texas and Massachusetts are at the top of the country. If we look at our black students, Texas is very close to the top of the country. California is two years behind. Hispanics, Texas is at the top of the country. That's the Department of Defense to the right of it. California Hispanics, who, by the way, have significantly higher income than Texas Hispanics, are two years to two and a half years behind kids in Texas. Eligible for free and reduced lunch? Yes, there's Vermont that's doing a little better than Texas. But of the states that actually have lots of low-income kids, half of our kids, Texas is at the top of the country. California is two to, the three, two to three years behind by the eighth grade. This is stuff we need to celebrate. Is it enough? No. Hope and urgency. The reforms that were started by the Texas business community were focused on raising the bottom, on eliminating illiteracy and innumeracy. They were not focused on producing high achievement. We have succeeded, or very close to succeeded, on those goals of eliminating rank illiteracy and innumeracy. 90% of Texas white kids, 91% of Massachusetts, are now above basic, which admittedly is a pretty low level. Only 78% of California. If we look at African Americans, we're the top state. 64% of our kids are above basic, which tells us how far we have to go only 38% of California. Mm -hmm. Hispanics were the top state, 70%, only 44% of Hispanics in California. Why is California doing so poorly? Mm -hmm. The business community has never organized itself to send a coherent message to the legislature right, in California. Legislatures are machines for reconciling short-term competing interests. Only, as Darv said, when there are external forces that hold a long-term vision, right, will we have an inexorable and continuing pressure right, for increase. Proficient. Texas and Massachusetts at the top of the country for white students. Texas pretty much at the top for African American students and for Hispanic students. How far are we improving? 10 points is a year of learning. Four years ago, so this looks from four years ago to today. Well, California is not only behind us, it's growing at a very slow rate. In the last four years, Massachusetts and Texas have added a full year of learning to their eighth graders. The teachers here need to see that that is honored. That is a massive change. How many of your businesses get this kind of productivity increase? This is a massive transformation. Hispanics in Texas now perform well as white students in California 10 years ago. Why is that? Because now we're actually teaching Hispanic students in Texas what they taught white students in California 10 years ago. Very few kids learn quadratic functions on the streets. There are a few neighborhoods, mine, <laughs> but not most of the neighborhoods in Texas. For African-American students, Texas is ahead of Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a relatively small African-American population. It's 15% of our eighth graders. We've added a full year. Same across the pattern for different levels. AP, most Americans believe NGA did some polling that our best students in the our best students, our AP students, are at the bottom of the world compared to their peers. They think we're somewhere near Rwanda. In fact, when you look at kids taking AP calculus and you compare them to students in other countries, they perform as well or better. This is really important because as the Rising Above the Gathering Storm report points out, that kids, African-American and low-income kids who take advanced placement courses and pass them do much better than white kids who do not take those courses. The way we can intervene is to make sure that kids are taking demanding courses. 
Darv mentioned the data for districts. Houston, Chicago, uh, Houston and Austin are pretty much at the top of the country on all these measures, or very, very close to it. They're three years ahead of Atlanta. If you're a black child and you're in school in Atlanta, you're three years behind where you would be after you control for other demographic variables. International comparisons. We can't only benchmark ourselves against other states. In 1999, Texas participated um, in the int uh, third international math and science study, repeat study. Uh -huh. Now, of course, 11, 13 states did. Texas finds it easier to solve ourselves to think of ourselves as a country. We all know that. 37% of kids in Texas were in the top quartile of international scores in 1999. And now think about the gains we've made since then. The United States improvements in math are showing up on international scores. In 1999, 20 countries were ahead of us. Only nine are now. So if we're going to change the culture, several things have to happen. One of them is we have to convince the public that we have the capacity to meet these new challenges. If we're going to convince the public that we have the capacity to meet these new challenges and that these challenges have to be undertaken, we have to point to our strengths, we have to mobilize teachers who have high credibility. Teachers need to be telling right, their neighbors that we can do this. It is going to be very hard to make forward progress in high school unless teachers can do it. And I'll tell you, four years of math and science, we have tens of thousands of teachers who are one minute ahead of their students. We're going to have to build profoundly stronger, respectful support systems for our teachers who are in classrooms now teaching pre-calculus. If you haven't taught pre-calculus or looked at it lately, it's actually a hard course, right? <laughs> especially when it's well taught. We have to make sure that what's on the marquee is actually showing on the screen, and that's going to depend on our teachers. The second piece, which is my segue to Alan, is we're not going to get massive public support for increased standards unless our children and adults want to learn science. And only a piece of this can be done in the formal education system. Right? A lot of it has to be done in all the science-rich institutions and in the culture. So with that, my colleague Alan Friedman, you have his bio in your thing, but he, his bio is a pale, just provides a pale description of Alan's accomplishments. He is also a member of the National Assessment Governing Board and um, is working on a project to develop the next generation of the leaders of the kinds of museums we were privileged to eat in last night. Thank you, Yuri, and I congratulate you for your wisdom, the two most positive speakers to end the morning, both from New York. I wanted to follow Yuri's lead and talk about creating a culture that will support the kind of science education we want to happen. And we all know that this is code word for getting voters who will elect uh, officials who will put the money and the resources and the priorities we need to get the job done. And hello choir, you've heard already that a, a demographer and a mathematician can preach, well now you're learning that physicists can preach. You guys at the choir, you know we can do this. The problem is the rest of society. They're not there with us yet. So if we believe in STEM education, how do we get all Americans to give it the priority we think it should have? What I'm going to talk to you about for the next uh, 15 minutes is that there is a whole huge body of resources and pathways we're not engaging. And we haven't heard a word about them this morning. Uh, those of us who are in K-16 to or K-20 through education, we're trying to work within our own support group, our colleagues, the people whose email addresses we have. And yet there's this vast rest of America out there that could be helping us. 
I'll show a little data, but not much, because these folks are doing their own thing. They don't feel we have invited them in to work with us. And that's the huge opportunity that we have. Well, let's begin with, I think, the primary reason the public doesn't, as Yuri has just noted, the public doesn't think we're doing so well, doesn't think we have the capacity. There are a series of perceptions on the part of the public, attitudes, which I think are widely shared, and I have some evidence for this. And let's take a look at them. Schools have the sole responsibility for science education children. That lets everyone else in the world off the hook. Science education's purpose is to prepare students for jobs and competition. That's it. That's all it does. Now, Senator Hutchison last night talked about uh, issues that require generating widespread enthusiasm. Uh, Leon Letterman talked about global warming. It's not a science issue. It's a lifestyle issue. And that means everybody's got to learn enough to want to change their lifestyles. But if we believe science education's purpose is to prepare students for jobs and competition, then we're, we're going to leave out the 90% or so of the population. If it isn't hard or if it's fun, it can't really be science. Science has got to be painful. And finally, science has nothing to do with the arts and humanities. And so in most of our schools, these are taught at opposite ends of the building by people with op opposite dress and temperament. I think each one of these is wrong, but more than that, I think they're perniciously wrong. I think they're damaging all of our efforts to win over the public. And that's what I want to try and convince you of why I believe that's true. Where the nitty gritty meets the road is if you show some pictures or set up some questions and ask, what does science education look like? Your responses would not be typical of most Americans' responses. Here are some characteristics describing what learning science looks like. A classroom with all the children sitting quietly and listening to the teacher maybe making notes. Ah, that's it. That's learning science. A classroom with all the children using computers. Please don't look at the screen to see what they're doing on those computers, but they're sitting in front of their computers tapping away. A backyard garden where children are helping their mother try and grow some tomatoes because the price of tomatoes is so high. A field where children are playing baseball or a science museum where children are playing with soap bubbles. Now, I would argue that all of these could be serious science learning and all of them could be not science learning, including sitting in the classroom studiously taking notes. I know what notes I took in the classroom when I was bored. It was what I was going to do the minute class got out. I used to write down the margins of a page, 30 minutes left, 29 minutes left, 28 minutes left. But I looked like I was learning science. Any of you seen the film A Private Universe, produced by the Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysical uh, Observatory, know that even Harvard graduates who seemed to be learning science went back to pre-high school interpretations of the phases of the moon or the reasons for the season. So any of these could be learning science, and also any of them could not be learning science. I think if we can in develop a public understanding and appreciation that science learning takes many forms and most of it can happen outside of the classroom, we'll see a vastly increased optimism. And again, I want to offer some evidence for this. But first, I'll just offer some perceptions for why this is true. If we talk about what science learning looks like, I think we all agree that there's at least three components. One is standards. What are we going to learn? And we can fuss about standards and whether creationism belongs in those standards or evolution, uh, but we can settle on some standards. The second is a pedagogical approach. And there's a massive amount of research on cognitive sciences, even the level of neurosciences. We actually know a lot about how people learn. 
and I can cite a dozen National Academy studies that synthesize and summarize all of this research. But the third piece, I would argue, of learning is motivation. Why are we learning this? You just heard about relevance. What's the motivation among children, their parents, their peer groups, the culture around them to learn something? Uh, those of you who work around kids a lot, and that's the majority of the people in this room, know that if a kid really wants to learn something, there's no way to stop them. Look at the, how quickly kids learn how to work with an iPod. In my generation, it was learn how to program a VCR. Uh, my mother never could enter numbers into her um, cell phone, so she waited until the six-year-old granddaughter was around, and, ah, she knew how to program names and numbers into a cell phone. Play a sport, surf, surf the web, surf the water, um, fool your parents, look cool, get a date with that cute boy. When kids want to learn how to do something, you can't stop them. So our task is to make them want to learn science and math and engineering and technology. And then, even if we don't have perfect classrooms and great labs and super curricula, those kids will learn. So how do we create this motivation to learn? Science or, frankly, anything else. If it isn't clear emotionally as well as intellectually why you're learning something, the learning, I say, and again, take a look at the research behind a private universe, there's tons of evidence. The learning is shallow and short-term. A burning desire to learn can overcome all sorts of difficulties. And where do we get a burning desire to learn? If you listen to enough motivational speakers, um, you will hear words like passion, awe, and wonder. None of us use those words this morning. Frankly, they don't come naturally. I mean, I'm, I'm a physicist. I never wrote a paper with the word passion in it, or awe, or wonder. I wrote explaining why the discovery that manganese bromide undergoes a second order phase transition at 2.0 degrees Kelvin happens. That's it. I didn't say, this is exciting. You guys are all going to want to hear this. It's not in our, maybe it's in our genetics, but it's certainly not in our training. There are people who do this. They're called artists and poets and actors and teachers. But those of us in the academy steer away from passion and awe. It's a little scary. We've got to learn how to bring that in. And if we don't do it, fortunately, there are others who do know how to do it. So instead, what do we do? And I'm just as guilty of this as anyone else. When I'm giving a talk, particularly to wealthy capitalists in New York City that I want to fund something, I don't talk about passion and awe. I talk about jobs and competitiveness. Um, well, try this with a, a, a middle school kid, a sixth grader. Say, you know, you should be studying this science because there are really excellent jobs and America needs you to help our corporations stay competitive. Uh, you might get a job in five to ten years when you grow up if you study this now. What degree of motivation does this provide? There's another whole class of argument. The knowledge and skills that you can get from science and technology will be very valuable in the rest of life. Uh, you know, a PhD in mathematical modeling can get a very high salary in Wall Street. But beyond that, it'll make you a better person. Um, has anyone seen evidence that scientists are happier, have more stable marriages, vote more intelligently, are more effective citizens in a democracy? Well, not my colleagues. <laughs> so what does work? How can we develop this motivation? And fortunately, we've got some data. Uh, actually, Rebecca was going to present this data, um, but I've been using it for years, too. The Bayer Foundation and the National Science Foundation commissioned really the most comprehensive a series of studies that go back to the 1930s on the motivations scientists had when they were children. 
Being encouraged by an individual is the overwhelming choice. There was a person, an uncle, an aunt, a parent, or a teacher. It wasn't what that person said, it was the encouragement that they provided, the role model. 72% of, this is a survey of 1,400 scientists around the, I think around the world, 72% cited an individual, a single individual, who said, you can do this, and this is really neat. I love it. Next highest was a school science class, 47%. That's pretty good. But take a look at this. Playing with science toys or equipment, 46%. I have modestly suggested that we spend an average of $8,000 a student a year in science classes, um, boy, if we took a couple of thousand of that and put it into buying science toys, think of the science toys we could buy for every child in America. If we want to produce more scientists, I'd go with the toys myself. Seeing science in mass media, 40%. Now, this study is done 10 years ago, and it's people who are already established PhD scientists and engineers. Um, the use of mass media and what constitutes mass media, like the Internet, has grown dramatically. I would imagine this figure is much greater. Uh, Leon Letterman, at least 10 years ago, uh, remarked that there was an extremely popular TV show called L.A. Law, and that what we needed to motivate kids in science was simply L.A. Science. And I believe Leon actually tried to talk producers and networks into filming L.A. Science. Well, they were very slow to catch on. And I don't know if any of them credit Leon with the CSI phenomenon. Crime scene investigations, and now there's CSI Miami, CSI New York, uh, the number one dramatic shows on television for several years running. And has anyone looked at what's happened to enrollment in forensic science classes in colleges and universities? Has anyone been to an NSTA meeting and looked at the exhibit areas and seen how many vendors are offering forensic science materials for middle school and high school? It's huge. It's had exactly the effect that Leon predicted. Visiting science museums or zoos, 35%. Again, when most of these people were growing up, there were relatively few. There were, for example, in 1971, when most of the scientists interviewed would have been school-age children, 17 science and technology museums in the United States. There are now 355. So the opportunity for scientists and engineers to have this experience, I'll bet the numbers today would be well over 35%. And doing science experiments at home, 35%. That, of course, ties into the toys. Again, this data is simply the most comprehensive in a series of studies going back to a study Margaret Mead did in the 1930s. So how do we capitalize on this? Uh, Cecily Selby wrote the, was, was half of the authorship of the famous Coleman-Selby report in 1983 called Science for All Americans. And it was really the first call, before a nation at risk, um, that argued for broader science education. And here's her description. Marketing and delivering science education not for jobs only and not for classrooms only are recommended to increase student capacity and adult choice and educational excuse, student and adult choice and educational capacity. So what does it look like? I'm a physicist, so I do what's called a back-of-the-envelope calculation, and I conclude that 92% of our lives are spent outside the formal education system. That's 92% of our time, our most precious resource, that we could be marshalling to support science education. Among these pathways are museums, zoos, botanic gardens, parks, visitor centers, television, magazines, libraries, the internet, family vacations, and hobbies. How can we get them to buy in that they have a responsibility, just as much as the schools do, to build a culture in support of STEM education? 
Again, CSI has learned it because it's a hot ticket. It makes them money. Fine, no problem with that. It's just our job to get more people doing that same notion. What would it pay for newspapers to start adding some more columns involving science and not just medical breakthroughs or misbehaving astronauts? Um, how do we do that? We need just a few models like CSI and everybody will be copying it. But we've got to get it started. We need to enlist all these pathways and get them to accept a shared responsibility. I think if we do that, we can build this culture and build it fairly quickly. So what does it look like in the end? I've got just two very brief case studies uh, to suggest that it really can work. Uh, I want to, in both these, address the role of outside of school to generate support and involvement in school on the part primarily of women and minorities. Okay, first let's look at visitors to a science center in an urban area. Here's the Metropolitan Census and here's the visitors to the New York Hall of Science, which I spent a lot of years at. You notice we're not doing too badly. We're a bit underrepresented in Hispanic. We're about right with Asian. We're a bit overrepresented in African American. We're just about on target with white. And other, which is quite significant in New York, uh, we're quite overrepresented. And we're getting even closer. Now, if you looked at the spectrum of the students engaged in science education at the colleges in New York City, nowhere even close. Incredible underrepresentation of Hispanic, African American, not Asian, and other is essentially zero. So these places, these informal science institutions, and there are many of them, zoos, aquaria again, uh, reach about 60% of all adults in America every year, uh, more than 60% of all children in America every year. They have the capacity to reach voluntarily. These are Voluntary visitors, not people who were forced to come on a school trip. This is weekend public attendance. And let's look at teacher training. This is a 20-year program. It's undergoing its third longitudinal study and a, quasi, a rigorous quasi-experimental evaluation supported by the National Science Foundation, program to produce minority teachers in science. Here's the national teacher population in contrast to a sampling of some 3,000 teachers produced through this effort, which is a joint effort of several colleges and universities in the New York City area and a science museum. Look at the Hispanic representation. It's 13% compared to the national teacher population, Hispanic teachers around 3%, Asian national around 2%, 14%, participating as a result of this program. African American, again, 5% of the national population, just over 20% of the graduates of this program. Of course, this is at the expense of the white uh, participation, about half the national average. That's because the program's targeted. But it's actually producing teachers, minority teachers who are actually in classrooms doing their stuff. So these programs, I believe, can work. And we have some evidence that this motivational factor, this girl built this molecule sitting down at a table for an hour in a science museum. I have no idea what it is. I'm a physicist. There may be some chemists who can tell me if it's even a real molecule. She's very proud of it. She went up to the photographer who was taking some general publicity slides and said, would you take a picture of me with my molecule? Now, how exactly do we generate that and how would we do it on a mass scale? This is one anecdote. I don't know. But here, it seems to me, is a huge potential. Allies that are just out there waiting for you to ask them to join you. And I think we fail to take that opportunity at our peril. Thank you. Um. Are there questions? I've gotten one leftover question from an earlier speaker, and here comes some more. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. The uh, first question 
actually to a former uh, panel, is how can African American students get accepted to math programs at our universities if we do not have advanced math courses on our high school campus? If there's anything core to the American creed, to our beautiful American creed, it's that the accident of where a child goes to school cannot be the determinant of the kind of challenges they can take on. We cannot allow accidents of where you go to school to be the determinant of whether you get to take science classes or math classes. One of the most difficult challenges, this Kathy Seeley, my colleague at the Dana Center, talks about islands of wonderfulness. We have this collective amnesia in education. It's so, <laughs> people don't learn from each other, and it's even hard to learn from your own work in education. Mm -hmm. We have seen beautiful solutions to the problems of equity in large numbers of Texas high schools. We've seen the AP uh, initiative that Peter O'Donnell has produced. We've seen AVID programs. Right? We've seen a whole network of programs in which you have students of color taking advanced courses, and then we look down the road, we see schools with identical demographics in which the school will be 70% black and Hispanic, and the AP courses look like Taiwan and Vermont have merged. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have to solve the problem of fairness. The whole American dream is built around opportunity. If we don't provide opportunity, why will people believe in the American dream? I wish I had better answers for that. Okay, question. How do, I'm going to ask them to you, uh, Alan, you can throw them back to me. How do you reconcile passion, awe, and wonder with the testing demands imposed on our teachers? Um, yes. Yeah. Well, as a member of better the National Assessment <laughs> Governing Board, I am a firm believer in the value of testing. Uh, the question is what we test, how we test, and how often we test. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, spent 40 years in the New York City public school system, talk about a survivor, uh, ending up as a district superintendent, and his conclusion was that the act, No Child Left Behind, was simply mislabeled. Its actual name is, No Child Should Be Left With a Behind. <laughs> <laughs> I must say I am very positive about some of the new testing uh, regimens that are out there. Uh, I think I'm about to see um, a sample of an experimental on-screen test. I've seen one of these as part of a National Academy uh, study group that I worked on. Incredibly exciting. It was actually fun. You got to manipulate stuff on the screen. And it didn't feel like I was taking a test. It felt I was, I was actually doing something I would do at home. I'd even pay for the chance to do it. It was so much fun. There are hands-on tests, there are screen-based tests, there are embedded tests, which are fun, exciting, there are real learning activities, um, and they can appear seamlessly. The FOSS project, Full Option Science Study, which is, I think, the most widely used elementary school science curriculum in the country, is developing embedded tests. You won't even know you're being tested. Um, and they're diagnostic tests. They're meant to give instant feedback to both the student and the teacher. So I don't think there's any essential conflict between testing and awe and passion. It's just what kind of test it is. Okay, I'll take um, one for me. How do I reconcile the picture? I painted this with my data and the data from this morning's earlier presentations. Actually, we were using the same data sets, right? And the message that Darv gave, I thought, was right on. Nicely balanced between what we've done well and what we haven't done well. K-8, Texas should be proud of it. Doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to push. The problems are high school and college, which is even a harder problem. I think of Rebecca at the Bayer Foundation, and I think that the only forces that will bring change to higher education are partnerships with the pharmaceutical industry. Yes. <laughs> so we have 1.2 million students taking college algebra in the United States. 50% failure rate. 
In Texas, we have, um, of the students who do not have Algebra II, who go into community colleges, only 10% of them, this is the new Higher Ed Coordinating Board data, only 10% of them complete a college uh, bearing, co a, co a credit bearing course in the first two years of being in college, and only 30% of the students who come in with geometry, mind you, pass a, a credit bearing course in Texas four year higher education. That is immoral. And for higher ed people to say the problem is in K 12, right, is not responsible. One of the real challenges for us is what is a responsible form of accountability going to be? How are we going to get the accountability system right for high school? And even harder is how are we going to put an accountability system in place in higher ed that doesn't homogenize higher education, that doesn't jeopardize research, but does make sure that people are actually learning something when they're in their institutions. Uh, Alan, accountability. Is it really measuring achievement, or is it measuring how good the students are at filling in bubbles? And why, as teachers, should we be proud of teaching kids to bubble in answers on a multiple choice test? Yeah. Well, again, I believe the um, right. author of this has an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, there are tests and there are tests. Mm -hmm. uh, and over the past few years, I've been looking at a lot of tests, state-level tests, curriculum-oriented tests, and um, NAEP tests. There really are good questions. There are people who call themselves psychometricians and they actually know what they're doing. Um, and again, the best tests are not onerous. They can actually be fun and stimulating. Um, but there are a lot of lousy tests out there. And unfortunately, some states, Texas and Massachusetts not being among them, have gone with the vendor who will give them the cheapest possible test both to design and to administer. And yes, they get in fill the bubble questions, which in no way begin to measure an understanding of science process or creativity or really deep knowledge of principle. They're almost all vocabulary recall. Mm -hmm. But there are better tests. And they're out there. And sit down sometime, just look at the released items from NAEP. There are thousands of them. They're available free on the internet. And you'll see that there are even multiple choice. By the way, they don't call them that. Uh, we have whole other terminology, and there are constructed response. There are good tests out there. Um, someone asks, is Algebra II really something that all high school students should take for graduation? Well, it's good to hear that question from here, because that's a question the public has. Uh -huh. So one of the great challenges before, if we require that every high school student take something to graduate, I believe we have to make sure that that has, should have something to do not only with becoming an engineer, which still a small number of people will become, but something that's respond, that required for good citizenship. Right? So this is a point where states are signing on to Algebra II in common exams. We have to make sure that that Algebra II exam is rich in statistics and data analysis, in modeling that provides skills to understand public science and public policy issues. Yes, three to four years of mathematics for everyone, but we have to wrestle with what appropriate standards are for courses that everybody is going to take. If in the default we require all students to take pre-calculus as the senior level course, public support will and should erode for a fourth year of mathematics. That court, we cannot organize our whole system around just the needs of our sector. I think we have uh, come to lunchtime. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.